Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're just over halfway through the Flames' eastern road trip and some interesting developments after the Islanders game and losing their goaltender. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk about how the Flames have been doing away from the Dome this week. How are you doing, Matt? Good, as always. Looking forward to talking some Flames hockey. They had a good week, six points. A little unfortunate news with the late injury to Mike Smith, but that happens. Well, let's rewind back to the Chicago game. The Flames are on a six-game road swing. They've played four of them so far. Uh, last Tuesday, the 6th, they played against Chicago. And the Flames scored too late to hang on and defeat the Blackhawks. Smith had 34 saves in this one, and it was a good way to start off that road trip with a quick win over the Blackhawks. What are your thoughts on this game? Well, I thought that Chicago, uh, you can tell that they're having a bad year. It's not the same Chicago team that we're used to, and that entirely makes sense. You look at all the players that they've dealt, you can only do that so many times before the wheels fall off the cart. They have too many dollars tied up in high-priced players, and frankly, they're going to suck for a bit. And that it's unfortunate for them, because the parts that they do have that are functioning well are still there, it's just not enough, and... In that game, Calgary was the better team, even though Chicago was heavily out shooting the the Flames early. And the Flames got the two points, which was the important thing. Yeah, I thought in that first period, the the Hawks really outshot us. But I thought if you looked at the play on the ice, it was a pretty even period. Yeah, and you could even see uh, none of the shots were insanely dangerous by Chicago. Smith had to make a few saves, but that were good, but not any consistent, like, wow efforts or anything like that. That second period, I thought Chicago was the better team. And then the third was, again, pretty even. The Flames, I think, went ahead a little bit in that period. Um, Do you think that that stone go-ahead goal should have counted in the third? I think that where it hit Gaudreau's stick, because they did credit it to Gaudreau afterwards, it look like his stick was below the crossbar where it hit his stick. It It's one of those things that it's a good thing that Johnny is so small that even though his stick was elevated, it still <laughs> was below the crossbar. The other thing I had in my notes here, I thought that uh, Travis Hamannick looked really good in this game. I was noticing him probably more than I have any other game this season for the right reasons. And I thought if we had this Travis Hamannick for the whole year we might be a much better off team. What did you think? Well, Hamannick, ever since pretty much the Flames got out in November, similar to when Hamilton first arrived, he struggled for the first two months. Hamannick struggled for the first two months. But you can see, like, game by game, Hamannick is slowly turning things around and getting better with each game. And his play of late has been nothing short of stellar and even in the Islanders game I think that was his best game as the Flame the Blackhawks game it was another good effort for him two days later the Flames rolled into New Jersey to take on the Devils and they extended their win streak to three in this game beating the Devils three to two Uh, some interesting milestones in this game with his goal in this game New Jersey native Johnny Goudreau has now scored against every NHL team except for Vegas. The last two he hadn't scored against were New Jersey and Vegas. And Sean Monaghan now ties a record that Jerome McGinley set in 0304 for the most game-winning goals with 10 in one season. Or, sorry, 10 total as a flame. Newendike has 11, and Joey Mullen has 12 for the record. So, yeah, that's all in one season, not career. Oh, is it okay? Yeah, so, you're thinking overtime goals because Monaghan coincidentally right. has 10 of those as well. That's right. Yeah, I've got different stats here, and I'm getting mixed up on my columns. Um, So it's – remember in 04 that um, Marty Jelena was the eliminator? That was his nickname. I guess we can maybe start to give that one to Sean Monaghan too because he's putting a lot of teams to bed for us. Well, one of the things about Sean Monaghan is that he always seems to come through when you need him. He's just a very dependable player. And even in the playoffs last year, he was the Flames' best player. And he, he, there's nothing about his game that strikes you as, oh, this is a star player. 
but he does everything just a notch below that. And because all of his skill levels are just right at that level, he does a lot of very good things on the ice. And 10 game-winning goals is evidence of that. And I think he's in the top 10 for goals of any player in the league. So he's doing very well this season. David Riddick has always looked good in this game. Um, I guess the most disturbing thing for me was only one shot by the Flames in the third period of this one. Well, that's been the Flames' hallmark of late, which has been unfortunate, is that they just sit back in the third period. And I don't really understand why they've been letting... Like, if it wasn't for their lack of consistency in the third period, the Flames could be on a 17 or 18 game winning streak right now. So, because they've lost pretty much every game in the third period. So, you know, if they were playing a little bit better in that final period, then they'd probably have more points. But that's been a problem for most of the season, unfortunately. And then after this game, it puts the Flames' road record at 15-5-5, five, and five, which is number two in the NHL. So as we've talked about, the Flames seem to do better when they're not at the Dome. Maybe this is their way of saying they need a new arena because they don't do good at the Dome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, you could just, uh, you know, have them, I guess, stay in a hotel in Airdrie or Okotoks or something and then just bust them in every game. And I'm sure that's going to go over well with the better ass. Yeah. <laughs> You don't get to come home. You're staying in a crappy Holiday Inn. And yeah, in the middle you know, of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> or put them like in Sylvan Lake or something. That way you got a long bus ride to the arena. Yeah. Two-hour bus ride. Yeah. We're back bus in ride. juniors, boys. <laughs> it's probably better than some of the bus rides that guys like uh, Jankowski have had this year. True. So, yeah, I don't know what it is, but they're doing well on the road. Uh, following that New Jersey game, the Flames went into the Big Apple the following night, <clears throat> took on the team that had pretty much written off its season in a letter to its fans, the New York Rangers, and weren't able to get this one. The team looked pretty flat in this one. They weren't able to get it done and lost to the Rangers 4-3. to three. And this one is one that you have to credit the New York Rangers for responding to the crap that they've been going through. They've been having a really tough stretch. One of their players, Brendan Smith, just got waived, and uh, even though he just signed like a four-year, sixteen-ish million dollar contract, and the team got called out for basically playing like crap. And good on them for getting their answering yeah, the bell. because I think that things would have went worse for them had the Flames just walked all over them. But, unfortunately, it was Calgary that had to be the their next opponent. And, unfortunately, we walked away with nothing. And, I mean, it was a back-to-back. We were expecting the Flames to be a little flat. And it doesn't be as flat as this one. But I was kind of expecting that type of an effort in a back-to-back. Yeah. And credit to both Brett Kulak and Curtis Lazar for getting their first goals of the season. And, in Kulak's case, his first of his career. His first in a 74-game NHL career. There's been a Twitter meme every game that Kulak's never going to score, and he finally broke it. Yeah, well, at least he's a better defenseman than stat-wise that he's shown. So hopefully that for both players, that just getting one will help them sort their own game out because they have more to contribute, and you can see that sometimes they're just snake-bitten. So hopefully just getting one will help the offense start flowing for them. And Ryan Lomberg also got his first NHL assist, and I believe first NHL point, mm-hmm. assisting on the Curtis Lazar goal. Yeah, and speaking of Lomberg in the next game, what was he thinking fighting a guy that looks like six foot five? That's just, a, you know, like, you can be brave, but, you know, you have to use your head sometimes. Like, the guy's like, <laughs> he could pick you up with one hand. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Well, let's move on to that game then and talk about that one. The Flames got a day off in New York. Uh, If you talk to the team, they said it was very rejuvenating to have that. And on Sunday, they were in the Big Apple taking on, or sorry, in Brooklyn, taking on the Islanders at that terrible arena that's a basketball arena they play out of. Um, And as Matt said, this game, Lombard got hurt and probably deserved to. He took on a big monster in a fight. Yeah, like, like I feel bad for Lomberg. Like, that one punch at the end was not 
you know, not a good one. And hopefully it's just he got his bell rung and not anything more serious because that did look rather nasty. And hopefully he learns to pick, pick his spots a little better because, you know, you might want to fight that guy, but you have to, you know, if you're giving up, what, seven, eight five, inches nine. on the guy, yeah. like... But I know, I mean, that's Lomberg's game, and that's how he's going to make the NHL as being that nasty guy. And honestly, I mean, I don't think Lomberg's good for much more than a cup of coffee. That might be the thing we remember about him. That might be sort of the, the end of his NHL time. Well, I, I'd be disappointed if that was it. But, you know, hopefully he can bounce back, get healthy. Because he has been a spark plug in the games that he's played. So hopefully he gets better and can get back into the lineup soon. Well, talking about that game, the Flames were in Brooklyn. Um, they got goals from Mark Jankowski, who needs another goal, so that was nice, and two from Kachuk, and ended up beating the New York Islanders with a 3-2 to two win. Matthew Kachuk is the best player on the team, just because he is such a dick. <laughs> you know, we have needed a guy like this with the Calgary Flames for a while, and I, I mean, if he would have come a few years earlier when Berkey came in, he is that truculent that Berger always talks about personified. We've needed a guy like this, I would say, kind of since Fleury left. Yeah, like, he drew three penalties in the game, scores two goals. Like, what more can you ask for? Like, just such an annoying player for any opponent. Like, I can see why every other fan base absolutely loathes Matthew Kachuk, because he just does everything right. And he is just such a jerk on the ice that he just goads you into those dumb penalties. And... They had a graphic in that game showing that he's drawn the most penalties of anybody in the entire NHL since he came in the league. And add more to his totals. Yeah, uh, this is a guy that the Flames have to lock up long term. Yeah, I think this is one when his contract's ready, like, seven, eight years, please. <laughs> and just go for it, because why not? Well, unfortunately, we have no first-round pick to try to get his brother this year. Well, you can always make a trade. Because that, you know, it would cost a lot, but hey, that'd be fun. <laughs> what what position does his brother play? Uh, center and, I think, right wing. So, so two Kachucks on the wing and you have a Kachuk sandwich yeah, line. Yeah, you know, the Vancouver Canucks had the Sedins, we have the Kachucks. You know, like, that'd be just fun. <laughs> Maybe we can get Dad to come out of retirement and center that line. <laughs> he can be the next Yager. Yeah. Or uh, Gordy with Marty and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name. The Howe brothers. It, Can you imagine that line? I bet his dad is still fight quite a firecracker in his age. Oh, yeah. Well, he even, um, Keith Kachuk, he even said that Matthew has a very punchable face in an interview the other day. <laughs> like, thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I found interesting about this game, getting back to the Islanders game, is the Flames have been, it looks like, changing up their power play. We were seeing four forward power plays in this game, which was quite a, a departure from what they're used to. And that's a lot of how that Jankowski goal came down. I mean, if you look, it was Jankowski, Bennett, Goudreau were the point getters on that. But when you got four forwards on the ice, you're going to move that puck quite well, hopefully, in the offensive zone. Well, that's the thing. It, with power plays, the ones that tend to be more successful, the players pass the puck very quickly and because of the fact that the puck's going here there and everywhere seams get opened up and there's movement and if you can create movement amongst the defenders you can get players that are open and we saw with the goal that Gaudreau found Bennett who found Jankowski because the defenders were caught flat footed trying to box Gaudreau out and it allowed Jankowski to be wide open right in front of the net. And if they didn't have those quick passes, then that goal doesn't come. And that's one of the things that has been lacking is that what we've seen on the power play of late is that whichever guy has the puck, he looks for an outlet. And he surveys the scene. And by that time, the defense is reset. And then he passes the puck. And then that guy gets it and surveys the scene. And you're just giving the other team too much time to set up. And by that time, they're ready. So if you do get a shot, or they can survey and see that, oh, that guy is open. I can just go quickly 
intercept that pass or whatever. Like it, it, it's one of those things that that's part of the reason why the Flames power play has been unsuccessful. So the fact that they're starting to move the puck a little bit better showed some immediate results in this game and hopefully more so moving forward. Yeah, you got to try something new, and I'm hoping that this is going to help Jankowski getting back on the score sheet to keep a few more going. It's his ninth of the year, but that third line has really been stagnant recently. Mm-hmm. And it, another thing, like if the Flames had like a guy like Aginla or uh, like previous like other teams with like Lene or Ovechkin, where you can just have the guy ready for the one timer, that's one thing. But there's so few teams that have that, so. The Flames, with their playmaking ability, they just need to make more plays in order to facilitate the goals. And it was good that it was Jankowski and Bennett getting in on that goal because of the fact that both of them have struggled of late, and hopefully that gets them going a bit as well. And I think that was Bennett's so, best game probably since December. Yeah, I really like Bennett. And I, well, I think that whole line, Bennett and Janko, I think probably both their best games in a while. Mm-hmm. So with that, the Flames are now sitting third in the Pacific at 66 points. Of course, just because of the way the Western Conference is, there's teams right on our heels. Uh, the Los Angeles Kings have 65 points. Anaheim has 65 points. Colorado 64. So we're starting to see teams like Chicago really get some distance in that race. But I'm happy. Anytime I look at the stats after the week and see us in the top three in the Pacific, I'm a happy man. Yeah, and like I think that what you're seeing now is that like everybody from Chicago down is gone for this season, and they're not coming back. So I think it's now I think just an 11 team race. So hopefully, one or more of the other teams that are in that same section that we are can start falling back soon well i mean it, it's interesting because it's almost deadline day and you're really starting to see those teams now that will be sellers mm-hmm. like it was so close for a while i was thinking this is going to be a boring deadline because nobody's going to be selling and now looking at it, it's like yeah we're really starting to see those teams that we know are going to be selling their assets yeah like florida buffalo ottawa arizona edmonton vancouver and chicago, chicago. Detroit. yeah like there's a whole bunch now that are starting to yeah. filter through of, yeah, we can sell all these guys off because they suck. So, Well, the big news of the week in the last second of that Islanders game, the Flames' Mike Smith dropped to the ice. Looked like he'd hurt either his groin or his knee. We weren't quite sure. Uh, got helped off the ice by two players. And David Riddick got his Whoa. his easiest probably game of the year, having to play one second for the win. Yeah. Well, he didn't get the win, but, you know, he held the fort. For one second, yeah. and, uh, the faceoff wasn't even near him. But. I think I could have made sure that the the Islanders didn't tie that one up either. So, you know, you probably could have put like, you know, Good. Matt Stajan in the net, and you would have been fine. Yeah. Um, so Mike Smith went down. Uh, the Flames haven't issued a statement. They're expected to do that Tuesday morning on February thirteenth. But today, John Gillies recalled from Stockton as a emergency recall since the Flames don't have enough goaltenders without him. Matt, what are your thoughts on the John Gillies recall? Do you think that he's going to stay here for a while? Do you think there's a serious injury? What are your thoughts? Well, I I think it's evident based on the fact that Smith was not placed on the IR that this was going to be a short-term injury. And Eric Francis also said Smith walked out of the arena unaided. Yeah, and between the two, because I've hurt myself just in day-to-day life because I'm a klutz, so... You can, you know, no like for podcast. No, but like you know, like when you do it, you're like, oh, I really hurt myself, and then like a minute later, it's like, oh, that's not really that big a deal. So I think the fact that it was just with one second left, that no need to worry about anything, and just you know, take the second off and. <laughs> I think even at this point, though, it could be time, and maybe this is what we need for an excuse for Smith to have a bit of a break. Yeah, and Um, I think that is a large reason why the injury happened in the first place, is just that he's been playing so much that his body, you know, he is not a young guy. So it's one of those things that the body does break down after a while, and it does just dumb things like what happened happen, and... Hopefully he can get some rest, and hopefully Riddick and Gillies can hold the fort. 
If I were the Flames, I think I would ship uh, Smith back to Calgary, tell him to meet us back here for the Florida game on Saturday, and let the two kids hold the fort on the road. Yeah, and the one good thing is that, one way of looking at it, is three of the next four games are against, like, the top teams in the NHL, Boston and and Nashville. So it's a good, you know, the Flames likely would lose those games anyway just due to the fact that you're playing the best teams in the league so it's going to be tough either way so having the kids play at least you're giving them a prime opportunity against an elite opponent to see what do they have and if they crumble then well that's information you need to know so that way you can plan ahead and if they do successfully against those teams like say they actually win to get one or two of those three games, then you're looking at, well, maybe we can play these guys more instead of, you know, just riding Smith all the time. These guys can actually win against the best, so, you know, you can get have more of a 50-50 split instead of, like, 80-20. Matt, would you agree that either Gillies or Riddick is going to be the backup next year? Oh, for sure. So in that case, like you said, you have to try them against the best. See, okay, yeah, they can win against some of the lower-end teams, but can those backups win a game, especially when it's important, but a game on the road against uh, you know another big opponent? And that is definitely part of what you need to find out from your backups. Yeah, and especially against two cup contenders, because that's the next two games that they're going to be playing, can they beat them? And you just need to know that. So that way you can plan accordingly because of who the opponents are. Because most of the games for the rest of the way are against more lower-end teams. So you can plan, okay, well, we have a semi-important game here. Let's put Riddick in against, say, Edmonton or Arizona or something like that. Well, I mean, a nice thing about this, and of course it's not really an intended thing, but the Flames play Boston twice in a week. So hopefully then this will let them see two different goalies, one in Boston, one in Calgary. Yeah, and hopefully Smith gets better soon. Just the, along the same lines, I hope Troy Brower and Ryan Lumberg also get better soon because, you know, those injuries suck. Is that time of year the injuries are starting to pile up? Yeah, well, when you're playing every day or every other day, it, it kind of, the little bumps and bruises and facial fractures all come out of nowhere. So, Matt, knock on wood, I'm knocking on my desk here, but should should Mike Smith be out for a long term? Do you think that's pretty much the Flames' indication that they have to shut down the season? No, and no, no, no. Do you think that, I mean, if we look at how many games have been won by our goaltender this year, do you think we can do it on the backs of Gillies and Riddick? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, Riddick has played, I think, nine games this season. and he, ten. ten. Okay, and he's played very well in each of them. So I don't really, at this point, see much of a step down. Yeah, Because he's, uh, he's, he's just done a very good job. So it's up to him to basically show that it those games haven't been a fluke. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think, like you said, Smith is going to be out long term. But if he is, I think it'll take some time to adjust. But I think the the looking at the Flames' schedule in the last half, we could probably do it with the kids if we had to. We might not get deep in the playoffs, but I think we could get to the postseason. Mm-hmm. I agree. Well, we're talking about goalies and workloads. It's already been announced by Glenn Gullitson that even before the Smith thing, they intended to have Riddick, it sounds like, start in Boston. But Riddick will start in Boston either way. 5 o'clock start time. But Gullitson was talking last week about the workload of his goaltenders. And we have about 25 games left. One of my questions to you is how you think they should be looking at the workload from here on in. Gullitson said last week he wants to limit Smith's starts to somewhere in the 60-game to 69-game mark and give Riddich or whoever the backup is the rest of them. He also said that after a win, he wants to put Riddich in the next night. So give that goalie a break after a win, which if you look at it right now, Smith has played uh, 47 games, and right now Riddich has played 10 games, started seven of them. So if, you, if you're looking at, let's say, 69 games, that gives Mike Smith 22 more starts sometime during the season. And looking at the schedule, 
I mean, yeah, we could probably get away with him only playing about 22 more starts. What are your thoughts, Matt? Well, I think that it'd be better because that range is from 13 to 22. I think that uh, Riddick will probably play in the 7 to 10 game mark the rest of the way. I think that would be more... It just depends on how well the Flames are doing in relation to everybody else. But I think the 7-ish games would be about right. And we'll see. It depends on how long Smith's out. If he, it's longer, then obviously the, that's one way to get the goalie some time off. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it. yeah, it, that's about right. I, I don't see the point in playing uh, Smith like 22 games of the, the rest just because like it, there's just too much congestion and with back-to-backs and all that. And the fact is, is that the Flames' schedule is more on the lighter side in terms of quality of opponents. Um, 10 of the 26 games are against the bottom 10 teams in the league, or 11 teams. And uh, another 9 are against the middle 10. So you're looking at mostly playing against the weaker part of the league. So you can have your backup play more often and not really worry too much about that being a liability. And that's why it's important that he's going to be playing against Boston and Nashville in the next week, just so that way you can see how he'll fare against actual good teams as well. The Flames played two sets of back-to-backs this month in February. After that, they only have one more for the rest of the season, which is in uh, March 18th, 19th, Vegas and Arizona. So, yeah, I mean, you can probably get away with, you know, sitting Smith a little bit more. You don't have the back-to-backs to contend with. And I, I can just see, just looking at the schedule, I have to imagine that somewhere in the coach's room, they've already penciled in some dates for the backup when they thought it was Eddie Lack or whoever that backup was going to be. But looking down the stretch, I mean, I'm seeing games against Edmonton. I'm seeing Arizona. I'm seeing a lot of games where I go, yeah, you could probably get away with your backup. Buffalo. Yeah, there's quite a number of them. Like the Florida game. Ottawa. Yeah, like there's a number of them where you're playing mediocre slash bad teams. So if your backup's in there, like, yeah, you're going with the lesser goalie, but who cares? Well, and it might, you know, it might be a good motivation for the team. Like, hey, guys, we do have this lesser goalie in. Um, you know, we need to we need to pull up our socks and get him a win. Mm-hmm. So let's just assume that, uh, just for sake of argument, Smith is out until the Boston game in Calgary on the 19th. That's three games. Would you, would you play Riddick in all three, yeah. or would you put Gillies in for one? There's a break in between each game, so sure. There's no back to back, so there's no real worry. I think Smith will be ready for sure by the 20th. If he's walking on his own, I don't see him being out until the the road uh, doubleheader. No. And if, uh, say he's out for two weeks, then I think that Gillies would get one of the Vegas and Arizona back-to-back. And I, I think that would largely just depend on how Riddick had played in the first few games. Yeah. Um, some people asked why Tyler Parsons didn't get brought up. Tyler Parsons also got hurt. Um, they're reevaluating him now. But I know we're high on Tyler Parsons. I still think he's a kid who he's better served not sitting on the bench in Calgary and better served playing in Stockton or Kansas City. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, so really when you look at it, the starter's out. Tyler Parsons is out. Gillies is in Calgary. That means that the net in Stockton is up to Mason McDonald to hold down. Brawler Mason McDonald. He got into a fight earlier this week as well. So Did he? Yep. Didn't fare too Maybe well in either too. the game or the fight, but yeah, what do you do? Yeah, he's played one one game, six goals against, but this could be Mason's, I really think, his chance to show management, can he do it at the AHL level? He hasn't been given a lot of AHL chances. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a good opportunity for him. Hopefully he seizes it. I I was on the Kansas City website today, and they list no goaltenders on their team. They I don't know where you source a goaltender at the ECHL level, but they're going to have to find two of them quickly. Hey, you're a fan in the building. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I don't know. There's really no lower-level league. I don't know where mid-season you find a goalie at that level. College? High school. 
hey, kid, you're 12 years old. We'll just stick some big pads on you. Don't move. <laughs> that, that, that's not weird. Have some guy in a van go to local high school. Hey, kid, you want to play golf? <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it would be an old, like, ex-college player or something. But they're they're going to be – it'll be interesting to see who they come up with. What's Brathwaite doing? We could give him Brathwaite. Um, moving away from goaltending, there's been a lot of talk this week about Sam Bennett. And is Sam Bennett past his expiry date with the Flames? Is Sam Bennett a player who the Flames have maybe waited too long on as we – Arguably saw with Jerome McGinley to move him and get full value. And I was doing some research this week, Matt. I was looking at every, let's say, good team in air quotes over the past five years. Not always the Stanley Cup champions, but the teams that have been very successful. And at some point, they've all had to leverage sort of a shocking young player. Somebody the fans didn't expect them to leverage to make a move. Be that for a high draft pick or a veteran or some sort of a move. Do you think that at this point it's uh, time for the Flames to move on from Sam Bennett? Do you think that he should stick around until maybe next trade deadline or the end of his contract? What do you think his future is with the Flames? Well, if Sam Bennett didn't have the December that he had, then perhaps you look at trading him. But when Bennett figures it out, the player that was drafted fourth overall is still there. And he's 21. So... So you think he's just going to be a late bloomer? Uh, you have to be... You know, not everybody's Gaudreau or Monaghan or Kachuk. Like, some guys step in right away, awesome, great, yay. But... And some guys like Backlund, who took a while to figure out who he is. Yeah, and Bennett was accustomed to playing a, his game a certain way in juniors because he was larger than most of the players in the junior ranks, or at least equivalently sized. And now he's on the smaller side of the NHL, and all the little tricks that he used to do magically don't work anymore because he's not very big for an NHL player. So it's a matter of adjust making those adjustments the skill level is still there you can see it in flashes and it the flat if the flashes of the bennett that we drafted weren't there then you'd be concerned and like other players that have flamed out entirely throughout the years it doesn't matter what player you're talking about that flamed out the flashes didn't come and you'd be waiting and you'd be waiting and like, okay, they might score a goal, but then they'd vanish the next game. Bennett had a month where he was the best player on the team, on the score sheet. Well, that's not a player that you get rid of just because he's having another little struggle again. I don't think it's necessarily getting rid of him because he has a struggle, but I guess it's do we look at him as saying he is an asset, he is having a good season, do we move him while he's still a good asset? That's the thing. His value for what he could be has diminished significantly because of the fact that he has had these struggles. And at this point, like I don't know if Sam Bennett's worth a second-round pick in a trade. And that's unfortunate, but it, his struggles have been that bad where you might get a late first, maybe, or a second round pick. Is that more valuable to you? Not really, because his upside, like, heck, we paid a second round pick for Curtis Lazar. Like, if Bennett does turn it around, you're going to get a high quality player out of the deal. I think it, patience is the key with Bennett. And we've seen other teams rush to trade players that didn't look ready at the time because they had they were inconsistent and they had problems in their game. But as soon as they were dealt, then they sorted it out and became star players on their new team. And I think that if the Flames trade Sam Bennett, that's exactly what will happen. Now, if you're getting a value that's commiserate with the star caliber Sam Bennett, well then, yeah, sure, but no sane team would ever do that. So it's 
I don't know. I can see a team who's going into a rebuild, somebody like an Ottawa or even a New York, maybe willing to trade a veteran for a guy like Sam Bennett to help their rebuild. Yeah, and uh, you'd be getting a value commiserate with like the higher end. Like they'd be buying the potential of Sam Bennett as well. Exactly. In which case, that's fine. It's just uh, you if you're just selling the asset just to sell the asset then no it, no I don't think you sell the asset sell the asset but I guess it's if I look at the young players on the team if there's one guy who the Flames say we need to leverage a young player Bennett has a great contract right now and he might be that asset that they they look to move if that comes up yeah and like I could see like if say the Flames made a big deal with Ottawa Say for like Eric Carlson or I was Hoffman. About to say Hoffman, yeah, or both. Then sure, uh, a guy like Bennett could be in the deal. So if it's a hockey deal, yeah, it, where it you go, yeah, it sucks to lose that player, but yeah, that's okay. And that's kind of what I was mentioning earlier. Is if you look at all these teams, they've all leveraged that young player at some point to make their team much better. And even if the guy goes on to be a star elsewhere, that's okay because they got an equal star out of the deal. Yeah, and it's sort of like what Colorado did with Matt Duchesne where they got a lot of parts in that deal, but they were all value parts and high-value parts to them, and it ended up being a very good deal for them. And if the Flames can have a deal sort of like the Duchesne trade where they're getting the proper value for Sam Bennett sure you know like if the right deal came along I don't think there's a player in the organization that I, you'd say oh no I can't trade that guy no but I mean realistically you're not going to see Monaghan you're not going to see Goudreau you're not going to see Kachuk moved no We've already seen the. We've already heard the GM say he's not looking to replace Furlan. That first line's in place. So if you look at, and we've had this discussion before, what valuable assets the Flames have, I can see there's teams maybe knocking on that door for Sam Bennett. Yeah, and there's a lot of different permutations available, and we'll see. Uh, it, it's hard to say. Oh, well, we should or shouldn't based on. Like, no secondary information. Like, if, say, Bennett was traded tomorrow, okay, well, what did we get? And then you can say whether or not, like, that was a smart trade or a really bad one. And, like, if the Flames trade Bennett, it has a high probability of being a bad trade for Calgary. So, it's it depends on what the Flames would get. I think there's that, I mean, when we're a rebuilding team, there's that place where you do take a guy like him and you say we give him some time to spread his wings and find his potential and hopefully we know what we get out of him. As we're coming out of that, I think that Sam Bennett really has to figure this out by the end of next year. He's at a $1.95 million contract. He suffers from what I think is the first round pick syndrome. We picked him high. I remember you and I watching that draft and seeing him and surprised we got him. And if this is a third-round pick, we'd be having a completely different conversation. But he, he suffers from that. I think fans expect because he was picked high, he should be the next Goudreau, the next Monaghan. And I really don't think that the way he's playing right now, he's worth more than you know two, two and a half. So I really think if he can't put it together next year at the end of this contract, then that's when you got to think about moving on from him. But give him another year. Yeah, and even then, I probably still wouldn't. You'd, you'd have to look and see if, like, is he hitting a wall because he's in Calgary, or is he hitting a wall because he's not that good? And, yeah, we'll see. Like everything, we'll see. I, I also think a lot of that question comes down to how well Jankowski progresses. Mm -hmm. um, I think those guys are, a lot of their development's going to depend on each other in terms of that kind of third-line center spot. Yeah, and I think that a large portion of the reason why they've... Uh, struggled of late is that they haven't had a legitimate NHL player on their line for since December so uh, yeah we'll see it, yeah I, I, I just seen I see no reason with a good contract to move on from Bennett I think eventually that time might come but right now at less than 2 million for a third line left winger 
it's a good deal keep him here yeah like there's no rush to kick him out the door if a trade comes up that makes sense sure but more likely than not you're gonna get ripped in the trade so why would you do it and i mean for how many years were these was the sea of red saying we should move backland we should move backland we should move backland and now he's become one of our most valuable assets so i think bennett might be the same way in that down the road once he figures out who he is and what his value is in the team he could be a very valuable asset for the flames yeah and having kachuk on the the team as well i think helps sam bennett because of the fact that Bennett plays that kind of agitating-ish role as well, and at least he did in juniors, and was very much a jerk in juniors. So, you know, if he can learn from Kachuk how to walk that line a little better, because, like, Kachuk hasn't taken very many penalties himself, yet he draws a lot, perhaps that just learning how to play his game at the NHL level. I think that's what his main problem is, is that he's having to adjust all of his game all at the same time and not really having any opportunity to figure it out without getting criticized. And honestly, I think that his game shouldn't be the game like Kachuk plays, that agitator game, and maybe that's part of the problem too, is trying to transition his whole game into something different. Mm -hmm. Just looking around, I think there's better guys to play that role than Sam Bennett. It seems like every time Bennett tries to do that, he ends up taking a dumb penalty. So I could see him playing more of that um, playmaker, you know, setup man role to a guy like Jankowski or another NHLer on that line. Well, Matt, you mentioned it a little bit earlier. Another injury note, not just Mike Smith, but Troy Brower now on the IR with facial fractures, which sounds nasty. I wonder if he gets to wear like a Phantom of the Opera mask to the arenas now. Well, he was skating with a full face shield, so at least he's doing well enough that he can skate without it being too bad. Yeah, he's on the IR. It's uh, retroactive to the 8th, which means that he can come back as early as the uh, the game against Nashville if they want him to. And by putting him on the IR, it's going to open up. If they choose to, when Smith comes back, keep uh, Gillies up here, that does open up a roster spot. My question to you, though, is if they don't keep Gillies and they leave him as an emergency call-up, it does give the Flames a spot. And we've seen any time they have a roster spot, they like to make a call-up. Who do you think would get called off from Stockton next? I think Morgan Klimchuk is due a game. He's played well okay. in, enough in Stockton, and he hasn't seen the NHL level yet, so it's about time that he did, just so that way you can gauge where he's at and see where you know what he's up to and go from there. Yeah, I think Klimchuk, the other guy that I mentioned to you before we started here tonight, is uh, Emil Poirier, who is a right winger. I think bringing him in and putting him on that fourth line. I think those are two guys that are getting a little bit older, and we have to decide as an organization what have we got there. Are these guys that we see long term? Are these guys we don't see long term? Um, I'd like to see Poirier up here. I've always been a bit of a Poirier fan. I don't think he's a top six guy, but I think he could do a better job in the lineup than, say, a Lomberg could. Yeah, I'm game with that as well. Uh, I just think that the Flames need to try some guys out. Sort of give them the Greg Nemitz or Chris Chucko treatment of, hey, we drafted you in the first round. You get a game or two in the NHL to see if you can stick. It's like Oprah. You get a game and you get a game and you get a game. Yeah. Um, The other thing, too, is if you look at the way they've had Brower playing, I think that Emil Poirier can probably play a bit of a better replacement for that game than Klimchuk could. I see Klimchuk is a little more of a finesse guy and Poirier is a little more of a, or sorry, Poirier is a little, yeah, Klimchuk is a little more of a finesse guy and Poirier is a little more of the agitator grinder type. Yeah. I think both Um, of them by the end of the season should get some time in one way or the other. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it sucks for Stockton right now. We're depleting their lineup, but that's what they're there for. Yeah. I think also Spencer Fu should get a game in at some point just for the fact that, you know, as a recruitment tool, (laughs) 
Plus, he's played well yeah. recently, so you know, reward him yeah, for his good same, play. At the same time, though, if a guy's going on a bit of, especially a first year guy in the AHL, I don't want to take them out of that because that could break the sort of break the magic. Yeah, that would be more of a hey, it's the last game of the season type of recall. Yeah, that could be too. As we start to take guys, you know, shut them down for the season. Um, <clears throat> we never like to talk about trade rumors on the show because. Uh, most of them don't end up coming into anything, but as we get close to the deadline, everybody likes to hear a good rumor. Pierre Lebron of TSN reported this week that he's hearing the Flames are listening to offers for non-rental scoring wingers on both Riddich and Gillies. The team has made a lot of noise lately about not wanting to do rental deals. Treliving's talked about it. Burke has talked about it. They've said if they're going to make a deal, they want it to be longer term. So, you and I have talked about this too. I think the Flames need a winger, and they have a spot of uh, strength in potentially their prospect goalies. So, those are things; those are assets I could see move to a team like an Ottawa or a Detroit, or even a, maybe somewhere like a Chicago to bring in a longer-term piece and give up a, f- a future piece. Yeah, and if you look at the Flames, have four top-notch defense prospects in Fox, Anderson. Shillington and Valimaki. They have three good goalie prospects in Riddick, Gillies, and Parsons. And they have a handful of good forward prospects. I would say okay forward prospects. Yeah, I agree. We're kind of weak up I don't front. see anybody in the system who we're saying this guy is going to be a top six. Possibly Dubé. I we, yeah, I think we got a bunch of maybe middle... Middle six, middle six yeah. to bottom six guys, yeah. if we're lucky. Yeah, there's no good draws or anything like that. So, yeah, uh, but uh, the fact is, is that the Flames do have some strength in that field anyway for defense and goaltending, which is coincidentally the two areas that a lot of teams need help in, especially a team like Ottawa who has a 37-year-old starter and nothing else. So, it... I, I could see something around Riddick and, or Gillies for Hoffman. Of course, additional parts. We'll see. And the Flames ha- have needed a sniper-type forward for a long time. And while Furlan's done a great job on the first line, the rest of his game is not at the level that you need. But, you know, he's doing a good job nonetheless. And if the Flames could get another guy of that same vein, that I think that'd go a long way to addressing the depth scoring issues that the team has. Next week is a week, the week before the trade deadline, so we'll break everything down more there. But I was saying to you before the show, True Living likes to get his business done early. I have a funny feeling my my flame senses are tingling that I think before the Flames come home, we're going to see something done. I don't know if it'll be the big deal. I think we see something done before the Flames come home. Yeah, I think so as well. And with the fact that the Flames have scouted Ottawa with basically their entire organization, (laughs) they basically haven't sent the media to Ottawa, but everybody else has gone. (laughs) Paplinski's gone, Lanny's gone, everybody's gone. So, you know, Um, I think that, like, they're really heavily scouting Ottawa for a reason and I don't think it's a, you don't do that for a one player trade so I think it's going to be a, like a, something in a larger sense like a Peugeot and a Hoffman or Carlson and Hoffman or something like a more of a blockbuster style because like it just doesn't make sense from a scouting perspective like if you look at how like a one player like say if the flames were going after zach smith or pajot specifically like you'd send maybe two guys out to see them and you'd send like two guys out to see a whole bunch of teams you don't send like the entire organization out to see you know even like if it's a bigger scoring player like hoffman you don't typically send everybody out just for and it'd be different if it's Vegas or New York where you can say, you know, take your wife, make a weekend of it, we'll send you out there. Well, doesn't everybody want to go to Parliament? Parliament? You know. I, I don't know if they do these days. 
I think the other nice thing about having an excess of goalies and defensemen, especially goalies, is those are the things the teams tend to overpay for. You often see, if you look at the things that teams most overpay for, it's young goalies and young defensemen. So that could work in the Flames system to maybe get a little bit, or the Flames' favor, I should say, to maybe get a little bit more back into our system for having some young goalies and young defensemen. And additionally, with both Shillington and Anderson being close to NHL ready, if the Flames decided to trade an NHL defenseman or two, that could also work as well. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that next week. Um, But to cap off our preliminary, preliminary trade deadline talk, we'll go to our poll from last week. And we asked our listeners, if the Flames were to trade with Ottawa, what can you see coming back? And this was a very distinctive uh, difference between all the options. Matt, I know you're a big supporter of them bringing Carlson back. Nobody thought Carlson should come back or would come back. Nobody thought John Gabriel Peugeot. The 66% of the respondents thought Mike Hoffman is the return, and 33% think Zach Smith. Yeah, and so I can I, understand that because, that, like, if you look at the acquisition costs for a guy like Carlson, like, it's not going to be cheap. And well, and I think if you look at what he adds to this team, you could ask, is it worth that acquisition cost? Yeah, and. The way I look at it is maybe they, you know, because Ottawa's owner is kind of on the cheaper side of things, that maybe they want a cost certainty where Carlson's, you know, going to obviously be more expensive. So, you know, you could possibly get away with something along the lines of Hamilton Plus a bit for Carlson. Because, you know, Hamilton is a 50-point defenseman most of the time. So, like, you know, it is Ottawa after all. They're... Right now, though, I can see a team who needs a big defenseman like our friends up the Queen Elizabeth II in Edmonton taking that flyer because they need somebody to build around. And I can see them having more young assets to make a deal with Ottawa work. True. Oh, yeah. Well, there are scenarios where you can make a trade with Ottawa with basically every team in the league that would make sense. Yeah, but I'm just looking at who also needs Carlson, and I could see a team like Edmonton needing that big piece in their blue line to anchor it. Mm-hmm. It just... Your top line of Carlson and Russell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very scary. For more than one reason. <laughs> So with the trade deadline coming up, since next week will be our trade deadline episode or our preview episode, if you will, our poll for this week is what do you think the Flames should do at the deadline? We're going to give you guys four options. You can, we should either try to strengthen ourselves for a playoff run, which might include paying for a rental. Maybe the Flames should be looking to buy, but only buying longer term assets. Maybe you're a pessimist on the season and you think the season's over. Sell assets to recoup draft picks or prospects or stand pat and don't do anything unless it's a good hockey deal. Um, Those are our four options. So we invite you to vote on the poll. You can do so either at our website at firesidechat.ca. You'll see the poll right on the homepage. You can do it on Facebook. We're facebook.com slash firesidechat. And we'll have it pinned to the top of the page there. Or you can do it on Twitter, and we're at Fireside Podcast on Twitter. And again, we'll have the poll pinned to the top of our Twitter. So we'd love to hear your thoughts as we move towards the deadline. This is sort of Christmas for every hockey fan, and we want to know what you would do if you were the Flames GM. If the Flames were to make some rentals, I think it would be like getting a higher quality fourth line forward because they don't typically cost very much. And, you know, just somebody that you can plug in to... Like, I'm not even saying, like, a center for the fourth line. Just, like, any wingers or somebody who can play a quality couple of minutes a game. I just don't know what we want to give up at this point for a rental. Well, those type of guys don't co- usually cost more than, like, the equivalent of a sixth-round pick. So, so then we pick in what, round four, round five, round seven? Sh- Let's give up the rest of our picks. Yes. All your mediocre picks for some quality fourth liners. It can be Trill Living's day off. He just doesn't have to go to the draft. Yeah. Can you imagine if they just had a table there with nobody sitting at it to keep the, the cover over it or whatever? Or you could just uh, have it party central with, like, you know, coolers with beer in it and just, you know, party central for everybody. <laughs> well, and everybody always sends their scouts and stuff. You could just have, like, Trill Living and one scout. Yeah. 
and a whole empty table just in case somebody wants to make a phone call. Yeah. If you're trying to cut costs of the team, there's a way to do it. Trade your picks and don't show up. Yeah. If you need us, phone us. I'll be on the beach. Yeah. It's the party table. <laughs> That's right. Whoever has all our picks, you're going to need them to let all your draft picks sit there. You can rent our table from us. For all those extra picks you have. Maybe that would be a good table for Vegas because they're probably going to have a ton of picks. Yeah. Now, what well, that, do you think about the rumors that they're still going to be selling James Neal? I don't think at this point you can. I think if they think they're a playoff team, James Neal is a rental piece. You're not going to get a long-term asset for him. So I think if you sell James Neal, you're saying your season's over. Yeah. So sell James Neal, Vegas, because Calgary wants the division. <laughs> I think at this point, I didn't think anyone would want to re-sign in Vegas who came in the expansion draft. I could see Neil re-signing for at least one more year. Yeah, so do I. Probably a longer-term deal at that, like three or four I years. Think if, I think if they trade Neil, it really begs the question of, is there something going on that we don't know behind the scenes for Neil to want out? Sure. You know, I mean, they, they might want the first-round pick, but you're not going to win. They have a sparse lineup as it is. They're not going to win anything without Neil. I think, if anything, we're going to see Vegas make some creative deals to try and bring some talent in without giving up a draft pick. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they're the one team, I think, who could have a very different lineup after trade deadline. Or they'll stand pat because, hey, it's working for now. So, Yeah, I just think that no one expected them to be in the playoffs. And if you want to give that to your fans, you're going to have to make a, a couple moves. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, let's look ahead to the rest of this road trip. Uh, we have two games on the road and two games in, at home before we talk next. On February 13th, the Flames are in Boston. That's a 5 p.m. start time. Then they take Valentine's Day off on the 16th. They play at Nashville for a 6 p.m. start time. Then they come back to the Dome for two more games. They play uh, Saturday the 17th against Florida at 8 p.m. And then on the 19th, a family day game. It's a matinee 2 p.m. start time. So some weird early starts for the Flames. Two on the road, two at home. Eight games on the board. How do you think we're going to do? Well, the fact that three of the games are against the elite teams in the league, sense says four points at best. <laughs> you know, winning against Florida and one of the three games. But... They still need six points. So that's what I'm going to go with. I if think they'll beat Boston we, in we, one of the games. I think they win the other two. When we played teams like Tampa Bay and other elite teams, we seemed to beat them the first time and lose them the second time. Yeah, and I think that's what you're likely looking at. We'll see. They need six points, though, one way or the other, just like last week. So, like, I don't care who they win against or who they lose against. They just need to get as close to or better than six points. I think you're going to see a loss in Boston because Riddick is in net, and I think you might get a bit overpowered there. Um, I think you'll see a win in Nashville, a win in Florida, and then a win back in Calgary against Boston with Mike Smith in net. Oh. If Mike Smith is out for the whole week, though, my predictions totally go out the window, but that's assuming Riddick plays Boston and Smith plays the rest. Or maybe Smith plays Florida, but I don't think you win Boston and Nashville with Smith out. That's that's a tough yeah. week. Well, hopefully Riddick has a good couple of games and steals the show. Because I'd like nothing more than to talk about the goalie controversy of, well, should Riddick just keep playing? You know, and, and I mean, we'll talk about next week, but if that happens, I think you also have to look at, is there maybe a market for Riddick at deadline day? Mm -hmm. I agree. D depends on if you think that Gillies could be still be that number two or not. But we'll cross that bridge next week. We'll record on the 20th next week, and that'll be our pre-trade deadline episode, six days before the trade deadline. So, Matt, you enjoy this week of Flames hockey. It's kind of nice to have a lot of hockey for once, but every other day it starts to grind on you, even as, a, as an analyst. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. We'll talk to you next week. Enjoy your family day. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. 
Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.